Hey everybody, Dan Kenny here. I am with Two Bays Productions and this is my first challenge that we're gonna walk through here. I have, as you can see, Elite Motion. I'm gonna unplug it and plug it back in real quick because that gives me better results. All right, so when you put your hand over the screen, it starts the bullet solver that this all lives in. And then when you tilt your hand, the RX and RZ of your hand are what is driving the rotation of this world, which moves the ball sometimes off the screen. And sometimes I just need to reinitialize stuff. So let's jump in and we can go through what I did. Here's my little render network over here. I like to color code. My color coding is orange for lights, red for cameras, green for things that have chops in them, purple for things that have tops in them, and blue for things that have stops in them. I figured Touch Designer already picked some good colors, or derivative rather. So, yep, here's the problem. My floor needs to be initialized, maybe even update the shape. Okay, so bullet solver inside, there's a lot going on. First thing that I did, actually let me clear this, I've got three floors offset more or less by 0.05, so we come into the X form, this one's at zero, this one's at minus 0.75, and this one's at minus one almost. So offset a little bit more than what I'm leaving you to believe. So I'm only rendering one of these. The other two are just reinforced, so sometimes your plane, especially with this, the plane is moving and if the ball is sitting on it and it moves in between where the ball is recognized and the ball just falls right down. So having layers beneath that will make it interact with something immediately below, which often enough tricks the eye into thinking that that one floor is enough. <laughs> it's not. Um, so what else do we have going on here? I have the walls down here, it's just a box top, and then I put a bunch of transforms off of them. The four main walls on the outside I make with transforms, and then there's one shorter one here you can see. Actually, I'm going to switch this to Geometry Viewer, and I will turn off this other thing that we're not really looking at. In here, this a little more visible. Oof. Okay, so here's our world. Again, you can see that my hand moving, both my hand, my hands RX and RZ rotate this platform. And that is because I have turned this into, in general, finite mass oriented bounding box. I had tried it with static infinite mass. It worked okay. It was kind of glitchy at times. I switched it, haven't noticed very much difference, so I just kind of left it as is. Um, for these, I have a little bit of friction on, but not a lot. Uh, let's see with the floor. Oh yeah, the floor is static infinite mass with oriented bond bounding boxes and no friction. I didn't really want to slow down the ball as it rolled. Um, yeah, so this is just a bunch of sops over here, mostly just transforms going into actor comps, and everything has its render and display flag on. That's how it knows to be the actor comp. And then they have PBRs. I just brought in this one from, I get my substances from the Substance Store with Algorithmic's website, so they're all free and you can get them too. I pulled a substance select out and put a level on it to brighten up my wood panels, which is, it would be quite dark if they weren't. Um, up here I've got the color of the floor. I ended up tying in that switch from the Twitch thing. Actually I'll open Twitch in another window in the background so that I can send myself some messages here. So that's where the colors change, and I'll give a little demo of that in a minute. This is the ball object, actor two, and I just like to put my sops in one container and my geo or actor separately. 
uh, just keeps my network nice and clean. I obviously didn't do that with any of this because I was copying and pasting it quite a bit. Um, up top, finally, I have this finish line, and when the ball goes over the finish, let me bring this back up and go to top viewer. Uh, when the ball does cross the finish line, you'll see this didn't happen again in the challenge itself, but once you get the ball to the finish line, it changes color because I have a little trigger that's happening based on object chops, which we can now go through. Uh, So I have object chops coming off of, or referencing rather, their target object is the ball, this actor. Actor 2 is my target object, and then my reference object is this uh, floor that says finish. I'm trying to hold this in. Oh, there we go. So the finish line is my reference object. So I am referencing Geo2, the finish line, and the target object, this ball, to figure out the distance between the two. So as the distance hones into zero, as this ball gets closer to the finish line, it goes down to almost zero. And we can see that I set my logic coming off of this distance to be off when outside of bounds. So once it gets between zero and two, this goes to one. And once that's at one, it hits this trigger, uh, which eases in. I have it stick on for a couple of seconds so you get the full effect even if the ball rolls off the end. Uh, attack takes a second to go up, literally almost one second, and decays for a second, sustains for about two seconds, and it takes about three seconds to release and that null finish is driving a switch right here between my black background and my colored noise background for the finish line. Uh, so that is how we get that fun little activity and null finish is being grabbed up above here. I have a select first select finish this. I never got around to writing that script. So on finish, I'm setting, let's see all my different fun things that I have. End time table. I have this little abs time dot seconds running and then I have a constant here and I'm using this snap function when this, when this game starts. So once your hand is recognized, here's our leap motion. And one of these parameters is hand, so you can see that hand goes to one when I wave my hand over the screen. And once the hand goes to one, the script runs off of a trigger. Uh, and it runs, it's changing some things about the B solver. The B solver starts pulse, and I have my timer snapping. So the way this works, is I have a constant running the seconds. I snap what second we're at when the thing starts. And then this math chop is subtracting the difference. So it's subtracting uh, my snap time from my current time, which gives you the elapsed time. And then I'm snapping another constant every time we hit the finish line. So that's recording your time. And when that happens, I'm updating a table called table scores, and I'm just appending the value that's in here as an integer. And let's find table scores. So table scores up here, just a bunch of numbers of seconds. And then I'm sorting a sort dat uh, by numbers, so it goes up. And then I'm selecting only you know, to the ninth index, so I get 10 results. And feeding that into an eval, and my eval script is in an integer of me.input cell divided by 60, so that gives us the number of minutes, and then I have a second one that is me.input cell remainder 60, so it gives me the remainder 
Uh, once I pull out the minutes, then I get the seconds that are remaining. And then I put these two into a merge. So for the fastest time of 10 seconds, there were zero minutes because 60 doesn't go into 10 any times. So zero, and then the remainder was 10, so that got spat out into this column. You can see the slowest time, it was a minute, so that was 82 seconds, so 60 goes into 82 once, the remainder is 22. And then from this, I did a little convoluted stuff. I probably could have done a replicator, would have made my life a little easier. Instead, I just pulled out into texts the, from the merge uh, as the dat entry, and then me dot digits for the row, and then same thing for the seconds, but I added in the text field uh, a colon, and that is giving me my saved time. And you can see over here I'm doing the same thing for the current time. I'm evaluating this current seconds that's running, and it's giving me minutes and then the remainder, 10. So that's my one minute and 13 seconds here. Just bringing that together, and that's what's hovering on the left side of the screen here. That's all going into my composite down here before I finish the big end there. I have an image of some sand dunes for my equirectangular map going into my environment light. Two lights, one light is uh, pulling B solver object two, which is following the ball. Yes. So this ball, I have an object chop that's just looking at target object actor. Ooh, you can see that's tweaking out a little bit. I'll unplug the deep motion again. Uh, so it's just getting position information. So from object two, I am sourcing this null's location. So that's where the ball is. This null is rolling around. And then I'm making this light a child of the ball, essentially, without it actually following the ball itself. It's following this null that is where the ball is. And this light is looking at actor two, our ball. And that's how I get this little spotlight to follow it around. Uh, we can look at the light settings for shadow. I have it just 1024 for the resolution, and it's looking at everything to cast shadows. Um, and it's 2D soft. Same thing with this light. Shadow 2D, low res. I wanted to keep it above 30 frames a second, whenever possible. Camera, nothing fancy there. Um, just have it hovering it above. I had originally set this to look at a null. Didn't really love the results, so I got rid of that. We can tilt this around to get a little bit of a better angle. But I noticed it's hard to tell how rotated your world is if you have the camera severely rotated. So after playing with it for a minute, I had settled on looking straight down at it. Uh, I, for my camera, I also set up squared exponential fog with 0 0.003 uh, for the fog density, and then I'm using this null fog map. And that's just a noise uh, with the output set to alpha null noise uh, times the input, and then that's over a standard layer. Yeah, nothing too crazy there. You can see it gets foggier. Let me turn that up. I had not a great effect for this scene. Uh, this little Marco Polo switch was the first thing that I set up to make sure that I would be able to tell if the sensor was seeing my hand. So it says Marco, and when you put your hand over it, it says Polo and changes colors. And that's driven by a switch coming off of my hand channel, which is being selected out of my leap motion right here. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much the long and short of what I was shooting for with the challenge. I didn't get the timer or the scoreboard done in time. In fact, I had to get some help from my buddy Scott on the scoreboard and the scripting. It's not exactly my forte. And let's see, here's another thing that I built that I started building for like a background and didn't bring it to completion, but 
pretty excited with how it turned out. I've got a grid that I'm getting chop data for the position. I just like to evaluate the samples in a constant chop so that I can use that everywhere else that I'm going to make waves or patterns. So here I have a wave that's a sign. Oh, this guy's not being used at all. Uh, so this sine wave is being multiplied. I'm pulling out here ty, tz, and tx. tz and tx I am multiplying, or I'm getting the length of, and let me switch this to geometry viewer so you can see what I'm talking about. I am getting this really fun kind of U bowl shape. If I only did one of these, it would only do it on one axis, where it kind of slopes towards the center. And when you get the length of the two channels, it'll slope in on both axes. And then over here, I am taking the actual image from my leap motion. I have it coming through a fit to match my samples. You can see this is 100 by 100 or 100, what is that? 10,000 pixels. So my 10,000 pixels are going into a lookup, I'm multiplying it or putting it into an inside rather with this white so that I can get RGBA. So when I put it in my lookup, it actually works because if I just plug this in, there's no color there, that's still black and white. So I have to get some color info by switching this to RGBA. Now null CD, and that is my color, which is going to an instance page here. Uh, I'm also pulling this height data, just black and white, mono, uh, and I'm getting a top two on the R, next frame to be fast, and I'm shuffling my channels by name because you will see they are all R and there are many, many rows. There's a hundred rows of a hundred samples. So I am sh shuffling them together into one long chop. And that is being renamed to SY because I want to offset my tubes here, my cylinders by wherever my hand is so that as my hand shows up, it pops up the grid, getting a little pin man, pin game action. Uh, so that is multiplied by the length of my SX and SZ, or TX and TZ, which I have renamed to SY also. And I also have this sine wave to get a little, you can see they're kind of pumping up and down just a little bit. And then this is going to another math to bring it down because otherwise, Let's bring to one. Woo! This is also rotating based on the uh, hand rotation from the leap. So this is a simple tube polygon with a small radius and just two rows. It's just the top, bottom, and the six lines on the sides going into a facet with just to make sure it's got a nice hard edge around it when it renders. And it's got this pretty boring, basic material on it. But it is up here, so that's this base for my instance and source geometry. And then this Geo 1, so you can see I've got my rotation coming from my hand. Um, and it's offset on the Y just a little bit so that it doesn't come through the floor. And on my instance page, you can see that I am pulling base inst, this info right here, from this long chain of multiplication, basically, of different channels. Um, and that's my txtytz and my uh, shuffled hand data from the color information that is now chop is coming in for my SY and my color is coming straight from the leap motion going through lookup. So RGB is coming from there. And I, again, wasn't in love with the effect that I got from it, but it worked. And we can turn this back on. Do I need to render a null? But maybe 
the game itself. Yep, and that's that. Let's see. Okay, I just had to jump into another window here on my computer, open up Twitch. I have, so we're gonna jump into my challenge two. Here is Elberza's very fancy Twitch chat uh, talks here. And I have, oops, opened this when I didn't mean to. Oh well, now you know my OAuth key and I have to change it. Uh, <laughs> So I'm telling you to look at my channel and my nickname and I can send a message. It helps if you turn it off and on a couple of times I have found. And also we can turn on the text port and see what it's spitting out. Because the first time I find sometimes it will disconnect you. In fact, during the challenge that happened, I turned this on and toggled it and it immediately logged me out. So when I was throwing nulls down to see what sort of output I was getting, I was typing info into the, the Twitch or the you know exclamation mark red, green, blue, and nothing was happening in these nulls. Now it obviously is, but this had timed out or just by default, maybe it just got thought it was getting spammed with people logging in at once. And I've just noticed that sometimes in the text port, it'll tell you that you've been disconnected. So you have to see right there, it says disconnected when I ex actually turned it from active to off. Uh, but sometimes Twitch itself will deactivate you or disconnect you. So that seems to have happened to me, or maybe I just didn't wait long enough to see what sort of info was coming out of this. But I have taken this red, green, blue, black, I put a select here to exclude the shapes uh, going into a null into a logic where I told this it is a radio button and that I want the lowest index to be on and that way you know don't pay attention to the name red that's just the first name of the channel here or the first channel's name uh, so I renamed it to color index so pay attention to that one when I write exclamation mark red it stayed the same and now green. Okay. And that did nothing. Okay, connected. Let's try this one more time. Blue. Blue. Blue triggered. Cool. So you can see index is at one because zero oneth place. And let's go white. Great, that's working. So now I got this logic, which honestly was all I really wanted from this whole thing was uh, to tell me what index I should be changing a switch to because that's how, that's how I think about this stuff. Uh, so I'm grabbing from this rename, which I know is very bad practice, but I kind of did this part in a hurry. Uh, so this is being selected in B solver over here, Twitch driven colors. So I just made a constant. These are small resolutions that actually match, I believe. Whatever, it doesn't matter. That's the color. Going into this switch, which is referencing challenge, rename one, challenge two, rename one, which was my poorly placed not null at the end of that chain. And that switches this color. So when I type in red, bada bing, changes red, which is now comp one. Oh my God, I know another not null ending my chain. I'm sure everybody's cringing. Uh, and if anybody knows why these constantly need to be initialized, let me know. Um, only the floor. And it could be because they're static objects and they keep moving, so it's mad at me. And we can come back over to our top viewer to see our output and see what happens when we, oh boy, there he is. When I type in green with an exclamation mark. Fun. Now it's 
doing what we want. Let's see if we can get a new high score. 10, 11, 13 seconds, and it added to the list there, right here. Cool, 13 seconds, I won. And that is pretty much all that I was able to get done. Turns out an hour is not a very great amount of time to work on a touch design project, so thanks for putting a fire under my butt. All right, I hope you all enjoy this. I will share it, I'll send it over to Elbers. I don't really know where to share this file, but you all are welcome to it. Have fun.